We move on now to our second presentation by Prasan and Parthasati from uh, Boston College in the States. Uh, his work has ranged very widely from a study of South India to Eurasia, and I think, if I understand it rightly, back to South Asia again. Uh, the subject for his presentation moves us on from connected histories to a comparative dimension in talking about comparisons in global history. I don't know if everyone else was also given a title. <laughs> but I was given this title, Comparisons in Global History. And it, it took me a long time to sit down and actually write the paper, because I didn't want to think about it, I think. But here it is. Now, comparison is, in many respects, the poor stepchild of global history. Of course, global historians know that comparisons are a critical part of their arsenal of techniques. And we've heard about it this morning. Comparison, connection, these are the two modes. But actually, if you, I think if you actually sit down and look at the corpus of global history, there's actually far less comparison than meets the eye. And when comparison is deployed, it is deployed or used without sufficient attention given to goals and methods. So the purpose of my short paper today is, is to elaborate upon these issues of goals and methods. And it begins with the discussion of comparison in history with a focus on Mark Bloch's observations on the method of comparison. The paper then moves to consider the method of comparison in the writing of global history, and it reaches two major conclusions. First, that the method of comparison can lend greater rigor and analytic sophistication to the writing of global history. And secondly, that global history has a great deal to contribute to the method of comparison itself. Mark Bloch's A Contribution Towards a Comparative History of European Societies, published in 1928, is one of the most systematic discussions of the comparative method. And in this essay, Bloch identified two methods of comparison. The first, he said, compares across space and time, uh, such as an examination of Mediterranean civilizations, Hellenic or Roman, alongside contemporary primitive societies. And for Bloch, a preeminent work in this comparative vein was Fraser's The Golden Bough. But most historians today, I think I can say with confidence, global or otherwise, would reject the universalism and determinism that underlies this method of comparison. But I think most historians would be more sympathetic to Bloch's second mode of comparison, which consists of making a parallel study of societies that are once neighboring and contemporary, exercising a constant mutual influence and exposed throughout their development to the action of the same broad causes. So in the essay, Bloch then proceeds to discuss enclosures in England and France as an illustration of this use of the comparative method in which he makes the now familiar point that the greater part of England experienced the great movement of enclosure while historians were only beginning to note the shift in France in some areas. While for Bloch, the state of knowledge was far too primitive to explore the significance of the contrast in the two movements of enclosure, the comparative method was leading to the discovery of facts. So the first fruits of the comparative method for Bloch were insight into the right questions to ask our sources. As he put it, a document is like a witness, and like most witnesses, it does not say much except under cross-examination. The real difficulty lies in putting the right questions. That is where comparisons can be of such valuable help to the historian. Now with the facts discovered with the, with, based on the right questions, the historian can then move on to interpretation. And here, Bloch says that comparisons can provide two sorts of assistance to the interpretive act. First, and most obviously, comparisons can yield insights into the mutual influences between different and neighboring societies. Now, for Bloch, this identification of mutual influences is less exciting than the second insight that comparisons can, can provide, which is the discovery of real causes. And in, in, a minute, in a few minutes, though, I, I want to argue that mutual influences actually have a great deal to contrib contribute to the writing of global history, more than Bloch recognized in his context. Now, so through a rigorous analysis of similarities and differences, the comparative method allows a deeper interpretation of causes in history and 
to reach the holy grail of, at least for some in history writing, a more profound understanding of change over time. So Bloch then opens up an array of possibilities for the historian armed with the comparative method. And his essay has been cited widely in discussions of comparisons and has informed a large body of writings on historical comparison. William Sewell drew upon it uh, and argued for the logic of a comparative history. And Sewell himself in the, which published this essay in the 1960s, but as he noted later in life, he read Bloch in more positivist than interpretive terms. For Sewell in the 1960s, the comparative method became one of hypothesis testing. And Sewell later on rejected it as he adopted a more interpretive mode. Bloch was the object of critical analysis in a forum on historical comparison in the American Historical Review in 1980. But other than that, in the, in the major area where a lot of historical comparison is done in sociology, Bloch is cited much less. Charles Tilley, for example, in his sociological statement on comparison, big structures, large processes, huge comparisons, doesn't even cite the Bloch essay, even though many of his conclusions are compatible with Bloch's insights. So what of global history? One measure of Bloch's impact, although partial and incomplete, is how often his insights on comparison appear in the Journal of Global History. And this is where I have to say having it online was of great help to me. And the answer to this question is that Bloch and his insights on comparison are cited exactly three times in the almost four years of the journal. Bloch and his approach to comparison uh, are mentioned in Patrick O'Brien's introductory essay for the journal. And the other two mentions of Bloch are both in review essays, one by Anthony Hopkins on comparing British and American empires, and the other by Michael Adas in a review of John Don Darwin's After Tamerlane. And incidentally, Bloch has merited only two other mentions in the Journal of Global History. One is a mention of his work on serfdom, and the other is a discussion of his strange defeat in a review of a work on the international history of the 1940s. But Bloch has fared much better than his intellectual partner, Lucien Febvre, who has not merited a single citation in the journal thus far. So, which I found interesting. What, the relationship between global history and the annals will be quite interesting. Now, the lack of attention to Bloch does not reflect a lack of interest in comparison in the journal. In the opening editorial, the editors declared a wish to make the journal a part of the process of proposing innovative comparisons. And comparisons do loom large in its pages, although often more implicitly than explicitly. And of course, global history contains, does contain major works of comparison, major books. Some of them have been cited this morning. Eric Jones, David Landis, and more recently, the important writings of Bin Wong and Kenneth Pomerantz. Now, all of the above, Landis, Jones, Wong, and Pomerantz, all rest upon explicit comparisons. But Bin Wong and Ken Pomerantz, in particular, they also have some important contributions to make to the method of comparison itself. So building upon the insights of Bin Wong and Ken Pomerantz, the remainder of this paper will, is devoted to thinking about how Mark Bloch's insights on the method of comparison may be more rigorously applied to global questions. So to re recapitulate a little bit, Bloch identified three ways in which the method of comparison can aid in historical inquiry. The first was in the construction of questions, the other two had to do with interpretation, and they were the elucidation of mutual influences and a more rigorous approach to understanding causes in history. So I'll take up each of these, but in reverse order. So to begin with causes. Oh, in the study of historical causes, the most fruitful and dynamic work of comparison within global history, in my mind, addresses the problem of the great divergence, as the problem has come to be known since the publication of Ken Pomerantz's magisterial book of that title. Now, the method of comparison can certainly be applied to broader sets of problems as sociologists have demonstrated for decades. And here, there are works such as Barrington Moore's study of dictatorship and democracy, Vito Scotchpole's work on revolutions. But in my mind, global historians have not developed the, the, the comparative method very far outside the divergence problem. Now, for that problem of divergence, comparison has been critical since the late 19th century, when Max Weber used it in his studies of the rationalization potentials of the great world religions. And then they reappear in Jones, Landis, and so forth. 
Now the problem with Weber, Jones, and Landis, as well as some other works, other work on comparative history on divergence, is that they operate within a deterministic worldview. The European path of development is taken as the norm, and those followed by other regions of the world as, are then seen as deviations from the proper or ideal path. Now, such and determinism is not inherent in the, in the method of comparison. Bloch himself used comparison to reach some non-deterministic conclusions in his French rural history, where he wrote that the depreciation of rents in the later mid Middle Ages was a European phenomenon, so was the effort of the seigneurial class at reestablishing its fortunes, but the differing social and political conditions of the various countries imposed different lines of actions. And it was, of course, this insight that Robert Branner further developed and elaborated upon. So the problem of determinism does not lie with the method of comparison, but with a deterministic worldview. Now, one way out of this dilemma is the method of reciprocal comparison, which Bin Wong developed and Kenneth Pomerantz then used to great effect. And to quote Pomerantz, this method allows historians to view both sides of the comparison as deviations when seen through the expectations of the other, rather than leaving one as always the norm. So the task then for Pomerantz was to look for absences, accidents, obstacles that diverted England from a path that might have made it more like the Yangtze Delta or Gujarat, along with the more usual exercise of looking for blockages that kept non-European areas from reproducing implicitly normalized European paths. So this procedure of reciprocal, reciprocal comparison denaturalizes the European path of development. However, it continues to operate within the framework of presences and absences of things that Europe possessed, but Asia did not. So it conceives of economic development following one of two paths, the European and the not European, or the industrial or the not industrial, rather than opening up the plural possibilities that existed in the world, certainly before the 19th century. Now, an alternative approach broadens the canvas not to just two, but to the many and multiple paths of economic change and historical development that existed in the early modern world. The path that was taken, to borrow some words from um, the late historian of 20th century Bombay, Raj Chandavarkar, <coughs> was to see the path of historical development as the interaction of a whole constellation of social forces that determine the sometimes wayward direction of change. So the method of comparison is then broadened beyond an enumeration of similarities and differences to a far more rigorous and careful consideration of context. And historical outcomes and paths are related to these contexts rather than simply the absence or presence of certain features. Now to elaborate a bit, and is related to the divergence problem, in the 17th and 18th centuries, states and economic actors across Europe and Asia were seeking to improve their economic conditions. The form that this economic improvement took, however, varied widely. Unlike the 19th century, when industrialization increasingly became a universal yardstick for economic improvement and progress, in the 17th and 18th centuries, the advanced regions of Europe and Asia were following vastly different paths of economic change as they each responded to their own economic and political and social pressures and needs. Therefore, in the centuries before 1800, the paths of economic change were diverse, plural, and multiple. So, then comparison then takes on a much larger task than simply enumerating similarities and differences, but it really has to move beyond a universal approach to history and try and really take seriously context. So this, I argue, is one way in which comparison, or the method of comparison, can be developed by its use in global history. In Europe, in global history, one of the motivating factors in the writing of global history is to decenter Europe. And one of the ways, I think, to decenter Europe is to take context more seriously and incorporate that into comparison. And this kind of contextual comparisons can, I think, enrich comparison itself. Okay, sorry. Now, let me move on to the second way in which comparison can aid in historical interpretation. And this is the identification of mutual influences. For Bloch, this was a more obvious and less interesting use of the comparative method than that of identifying causes. And he wrote that the discernment of mutual influences was the most obvious service 
we can hope from careful comparison, while comparison for the elucidation of causes is the most conspicuous service. From the perspective of writing global history, however, the identification of mutual influences may be the more significant contribution of the method of comparison. And here it is worth recalling that Bloch's essay was a contribution to a comparative history of European societies. The, Euro the discovery of mutual influences on a European canvas may appear trivial in comparison to the identification of real historical causes. On a global canvas, however, the identification and interpretation of mutual influences has far more profound implications. And let me illustrate this claim with some examples drawn from the forthcoming book, The Spinning World, A Global History of Cotton Textiles, 1200-1850, which I have edited with Giorgio Riello at the Global History Center at Warwick University. And a number of contributors to the volume are here to take a little break. I'm going to advertise this book. <laughs> it is available. You have this in your packet, and you can get it for, at the discounted price of 60 pounds. But it's a very big book, it's about 500 pages. So the price per page is quite low in comparison to other books <laughs> from Oxford University Press. Mm -hmm. Now the Cotton Project was one of the strands of the Global Economic History Network, and the focus on cotton was selected for its potential to shed light on the problem of, a di of divergence. As we wrote in the introduction, Georgia and I, to the volume, however, and here I'm quoting from the introduction, the project matured into a global history with a far broader agenda, as it identified a number of striking parallels in the production and consumption of cotton textiles around the world between 1200 and 1700. The identification of this global cotton revolution, which preceded the European cotton revolution of the 18th century, emerged from putting a number of regions of the world next to each other, so to speak, which revealed striking similarities in patterns of change. In other words, it was an exercise in comparison which revealed a striking global pattern. Central to this global pattern were a set of mutual influences, which may also be seen as different forms of connections that link together different regions of the world. In the cotton volume, the most important form of connection was trade, but the simple act of exchange spurred new connections on the basis of knowledge, the movement of people, and the transmissions of notions of fashionability and forms of consumption. Now, the Indian subcontinent was critical in these links as, as it was the nodal point from which many of these connections emanated in the period between 1200 and 1700. I'm now using mutual influences interchangeably with connections, but these mutual influences or connections were derived from the starting point of comparison. And I think this makes a difference. The starting point of comparison lent this notion of mutual influences great rigor. And I'll say a little bit in a few minutes on why these mutual influences were invested with great rigor when we started from the vantage point of comparison. For the moment, let me simply conclude this section of the paper with the point that the identification of mutual influences of this sort is one of the major contributions of the comparative method to global history. But the identification of mutual influences makes a second and even more important contribution. Comparison must, in a kind of dialectic fashion, based on the study of mutual influences, produce a new integration or synthesis of the objects of comparison into a single framework of analysis. Again, please allow me to quote from my introduction with Giorgio Riello to elaborate upon this. In this volume, a consideration of mutual influences and the integration of the cases of comparison into a single framework lead logically to the global economy. For the Indian subcontinent had a truly global reach and putting together its areas of influence in the centuries from 1200 to 1800 leads to the global trading system. And it was this global economic order in which the cotton manufacturers of the Indian subcontinent were dominant that provided the context and an impetus for cotton consumption and production in many regions around the world. A focus on the global economy and therefore a history written at the global level emerges organically from the study of cottons in disparate locations itself. It is only within a global framework that the many connections and mutual influences can be contained and made sense of. The need to confront the global emerges from the study of cotton textiles themselves and is not imposed from the outside. And I think, I think we, one, of the, one of the problems we're having with many historians who, who are suspicious of global approaches is that they, they say, well, what's the value added? What do I get out of it? And I think, I think global, the writing of global history has, has to, in a sense, emerge organically out of the material itself. And this is what happened in this cotton volume, that it was only within a global framework that all of these things that we 
uh, could identify in disparate regions of the, around the world could be made sense of, could be explained. So our cotton volume requires a global history not because it is interesting or fashionable, but because the comparative interpretation of the material and evidence demands it. Now, the use of comparison to identify and interpret mutual influences provides a powerful logic and argument for the writing of global history, which is why the study of mutual influences may be even more important than the search for causes when using the method of comparison. The third and final contribution that comparison can, can make, or according to Bloch, was in asking the right questions. Now, Bloch discussed this in relation to, the ask, to asking the right questions of documents, but this is one dimension of Bloch's larger problem-centered approach to the writing of history. Bernard Balin has put the importance of the historical problem in admirable terms in a review of Fernand Braudel's Mediterranean, which was published in the Journal of Economic History in 1951. And there, Balin wrote that the formulation of a valid problem is as much the necessary ingredient for superior work in history as the sympathetic identification of scholar and subject. Such problems must first be concerned with movements through time in the affairs of men living in organized groups. And Balin then proceeded in this review of Brodel to cite with approval Bloch's feudal society, which was organized around the clear historical problem that followed from the question, what was the nature of feudal society? The method of comparison, therefore, forces the historian to formulate problems to end up and to ask questions that need answering, which lends the writing of global history and analytic rigor. For one cannot do comparisons without a larger purpose or a larger problem or a larger question in mind. And this is why the mutual influences that are identified through the act of comparison are rigorous forms of connect connection. They are identified in order to answer a specific question or solve a spe specific historical problem. Therefore, the method of comparison pushes global historians beyond the descriptive mode into the analytic and lends global history sophistication. Thank you.